1936, the Berlin Olympic Games. Riefenstahl was a fantastic source for this because um, I got hold of not only her films, Olympia and um, Triumph of the Will, but all of the offcuts. And Is that, that a fact? Yeah, and that enabled me to describe exactly what was happening in Berlin and also on the sports arena. 33 young Australian athletes attended those games, or well, Larry Wright's new book is called Dangerous Games, and it tells the story of those athletes, the games themselves, and the effect the experiences had on them for the rest of their lives. They were normal kids from all around the country who had this dream of going to an Olympic Games, and they would have trained and come to prominence in the late 20s and the early 30s, and after an exhaustive process, qualified to go to the Games. But the problem is that they didn't know what they were getting into. And the Australians who went and competed, there was one key source you have who lived to the age of 98. When I was doing my research, I contacted the Australian Olympic Committee and said, is there anyone still alive from the 1936 Games? And I was told that there was a gentleman called Basil Dickinson who was 98 and in a aged care facility in Western Sydney for six months every Monday, I would go to the facility and we'd sit down in his room. He was such a special man and he had such wonderful insights about the changes that occurred to him and how he went over there so excited and so keen to be part of this big Olympic Games. And the things he saw there, he wasn't surprised at all when war broke out three years later. And when he saw the newsreel films and the news reports of the destruction of Berlin, and read about the 400 athletes who had competed at the Berlin Games who didn't survive the war. He was terribly sad. And he came back feeling um, very much against the commercialization of the Olympic Games, very much against the way governments use it as a political tool and the need for a bigger and better spectacle each time. I think he harked back to the days of amateurism of fair play and friendship between nations instead of this win-at-all-costs competitiveness that happens today. The athletes were encouraged to make contact with the ordinary Berliners, weren't they? They were indeed. It was all part of Goebbels' master plan to have people leave Berlin at the end of the Olympic period full of good news, saying that we have nothing to worry about with Germany. They're a wonderful race. Um, they made us feel so good. They instituted things like the population was told if it was a sunny day, it was to be referred to as Hitler weather. And June 17 to 24 was laughing week, where everybody had to go around laughing and being jolly. And already at this stage, you know, the gypsies and disabled and Jews, Jews and communists and social yeah, democrats were being yep. murdered and locked up. Yes. And because of that, and because <clears throat> that was on the public record, the Jewish organisations of the world, many uh, organisations in America, called for the Games to be boycotted. From 33 to 36 in the lead-up to the Games, in America particularly, uh, and to a lesser extent in Britain and virtually nowhere else, there were very, very strong boycott um, movements simply because uh, German Jews were being excluded from selection in the German team. Um, Avery Brundage, who was the head of the Olympic Committee in America, was very for the Games and denigrated the opposition to it. And in the end, when it came to the vote, America decided to go. And once America went, the rest of the world fell into step and Germany realised that they'd pulled off their publicity masterstroke. Yes, with the exception, of course, of a single African-American runner. Jesse Owens, of course, he was conflicted by this because he was experiencing that same persecution being a black man. He was segregated in Berlin and at home. That's right. And on the boat going over as well with other African-American runners. What about going back with a gold medal around his neck? He'd fallen out with management badly by the time he returned to America because he couldn't afford to be an amateur anymore. And he was offered many lucrative show business and advertising contracts. And he told Avery Brundage, the American chief, that he was going to take them up at which point he was ostracised for being a professional and he went back in virtual disgrace. All of the job offers um, evaporated and he spent the rest of his days performing at county fairs, racing against racehorses. Goodness me. It's terribly sad. <laughs> <laughs> 